And our subject this evening is the mystery of His presence. And so with that, we'll jump right into uh, our scripture this evening. It's taken from Exodus chapter 25, verses 1 through 9. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. From everyone who gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen, and goat's hair, ram skins dyed red, badger skins, and acacia wood, oil for the light and spices for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense, onyx stones, and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make me what? A sanctuary, that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. Now, God wanted them to build him this tabernacle. For, for what purpose do we read in this scripture? Why, why did he want them to build it? So that he could dwell with them. Now, was there a personal sacrifice that was involved in the building of this tabernacle? Yeah, these people were to bring free will offerings. Isn't that right? And these are very costly materials that are being given. So there's a very high cost, we could say, a personal sacrifice for the building of this tabernacle. And of course, I'm sure you've studied this before. This is an air you know, view looking down upon the sanctuary there. You've got the gate at the front. You come in, the first thing you see is that altar of sacrifice, then the bronze laver, and then you enter into the enclosed section of that tabernacle, the first compartment being the holy place, which contained how many items? Three items. You had the table of showbread, the altar of incense, and of course the candlestick there. And then you went into the most holy place. Exodus 25, God says, You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. What is that testimony? Ten Commandments. And there I will meet with you and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. So in a very special way, in this most holy place, God would manifest himself. Now we just read there that the Ark of the Covenant would be the article of furniture that was in there. And of course, in the Ark was the Ten Commandments. And you have those two angels looking down, sort of upon that mercy seat which stood above the law, that perfect marriage of justice and mercy together. Now there's something that would be in the most holy place that Scripture does not mention specifically, but it alludes to. It said that His presence would be there. Now what do we call that presence? the Shekinah glory. That's right. Now, again, the word is not used in Scripture, but it comes from the very word. When, it, when he said, build me a sanctuary that I may dwell with my people, we get the word Shekinah from the Hebrew word Shekan, which means to permanently dwell. It's the whole purpose of the tabernacle that he may permanently dwell there with his people. Now, how many people could go in and see that Shekinah glory? Only one, the high priest, and how often? Once a year. That's right. If you wanted to know what the Shekinah glory looked like, who would you have to talk to? The high priest. You'd have to go to him. You'd have to say, hey, what was that like to go into the most holy place? Well, you know, tell me about it, because you couldn't go in there. Uh, this is from Hebrews 9, verse 7. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. Now, Patriarchs and Prophets tells us, above the mercy seat was the Shekinah, the manifestation of the divine presence. And from between the cherubim, God made known his will. Divine messages were sometimes communicated to the high priest by a voice from the cloud. Sometimes a light fell upon the angel at the right to signify approval or acceptance or a shadow or cloud rested upon the one at the left to reveal disapproval or rejection. Have you ever read about the breastplate of Aaron that had upon it the Urim and the Thummim? Same concept where sometimes God would answer their request by lighting one of those stones versus the other. 
Were there evidences of the Shekinah that the people would have even though they couldn't go into the most holy place? Sure. They had that cloud that would be above the tabernacle by day. And what was there by night? That pillar of fire, right? And there were evidences when the tabernacle was dedicated. It says here in Exodus 40, Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So much so, it says, And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of the meeting, because the cloud rested above it, and the glory of the Lord filled the entire tabernacle. And I'm sure the people were in awe as they were surrounded. You know, this tabernacle was surrounded by God's people, and they, they saw the evidence that God's very presence was coming into this house. You know, we read a very similar thing when later in time Solomon built a temple. And of course, that temple was just a larger, you know, a larger edifice that was the sanctuary, but just a permanent structure. And when that temple was dedicated, we read in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 10, And it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house. Let me ask you a question this evening. Now we know it was the presence of God. And this may seem like a silly question, but I like, I like to just ask questions to myself until I answer everything. Do you, do you study the Bible that way? It's the glory of God, but whose glory is it? In other words, was it God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit? Or was it all three? Prophets and kings, page 18. Christ was their instructor. As he had been with them in the wilderness, so he was still to be their teacher and guide. In the tabernacle and the temple, his glory dwelt in the holy Shekinah above the mercy seat. In their behalf, he constantly manifested the riches of his love and patience. Now that we know whose glory it was, let me ask another question. What really is that glory? Now we know it's an it's a unapproachable light. We know that it's an all-consuming fire. But at the very heart of God's glory, what really are we talking about? That's right. Amen, brother. His character. I should let you come up here and just finish this. <laughs> you know, Moses asked this question of God prior to the dedication of the sanctuary. We find there in Exodus 33, Moses said, please, God, show me your glory. And then God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion and on whom I will have compassion. And we remember as we read through Exodus the next day, he takes the two tables of stone up on the mountain. Remember, God said he would proclaim his name before Moses, didn't he? Then Moses rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, and he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Now, do you see mercy in the character of God here? Absolutely. Do you see justice in the character of God? Absolutely. When you study God's character, you see both the goodness and the severity of God. Of course, what that glory really is, as our brother told us, is the character of God. That's what the glory really is. Just from being in the presence of God's character. You remember what Moses' face shone as he came down the mountain so much that they had to veil his face? Exodus 34. Now it happened so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tables of stone were in his hands that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Even the reflection of someone who was in the presence of God was something that would cause fear to come upon the people. There were evidences in other ways of that Shekinah glory among the people. 
You may remember there were rebellions that would take place against Moses and Aaron and the different leadership. Remember the rebellion of Korah, where the earth swallowed up Korah and his family. Numbers chapter 16, those who were in rebellion with Korah. Later on it says, Then all Israel who were around them fled at their cry, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. And notice what happened. Fire came out from the Lord, from the Shekinah, and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. They were in rebellion with Korah. Later in the same chapter, you can read about 14,700 that die as they continue this rebellion against the Lord. And the evidence of that Shekinah, that very presence of God, comes out with that hand of justice and strikes them down. Now it's unfortunate, but as you read the story of the nation of Israel, are they um, accountable to God? Are they obedient to God? Or do they fall away? They seek after other gods, don't they? They fall away from His law and His counsel. So the visible manifestation of God's glory was with that first sanctuary. It was with the temple that Solomon built. But what's interesting is as they went further and further into apostasy, the Shekinah glory leaves. You can read about that in the book of Ezekiel. It's in chapter 9 and verse 3 and chapter 10 and verse 4 that the glory left first where? The holiest of all and departed to the threshold of the house. Then we read in chapter 10 that it departed from the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house. In Ezekiel 11, verses 22 and 23, it says, So the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was high above them. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. So step by step, we see that God's glory departs slowly from His house, almost reluctant to leave His people. Now, does anybody know what the mountain is on the east side of the city? It's the Mount of Olives. So you have the Shekinah glory departing from the temple, and where does it rest? On the Mount of Olives. That's very familiar to us because this is exactly where Jesus retreated When he left the temple and he said, your house is left unto you desolate, right? Went to the same mount and that's where he spoke the words, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. We find in Desire of Ages, page 830, she speaks of this departing of the Shekinah glory. She says, The holy Shekinah, in departing from the first temple, had stood upon the eastern mountain, as if loath to forsake the chosen city, so Christ stood upon all of it with yearning heart, overlooking Jerusalem. Isn't that powerful? Now, if you're thinking historically, Israel is in rebellion, apostasy. God is sending prophet after prophet, warning them to come back. Come back. They're playing the harlot. And God, in His love for them, is constantly yearning after them, trying to woo them back into relationship with Him. But eventually, things got so bad that the Shekinah, as we read in Ezekiel, actually leaves the temple. The presence of God is visibly not even there. We find that Babylon comes and ransacks the temple. Remember the story? And there are articles of that temple that they then take captive with them during that time. Now we know that before this took place, before Babylon came in and destroyed Jerusalem, that the priests were actually told to hide the Ark of the Covenant. Have you ever read that? Spiritual Gifts, page 114. Before the temple was destroyed, God made known to a few of His faithful servants the fate of the temple, which was the pride of Israel, and which they regarded with idolatry while they were sinning against God. He also revealed to them the captivity of Israel. These righteous men, just before the destruction of the temple, removed the sacred ark containing the tables of stone, and with mourning and sadness, secreted it in a cave where it is to be hid from the people of Israel because of their sins." and was to be no more restored to them. That sacred ark is yet hid 
It has never been disturbed since it was secreted. Isn't that interesting? Now, if you're thinking timeline-wise, I like to put things in a timeline because I'm a very visual person. You have the tabernacle that Moses was instructed to build in that desert wandering. Was the glory of God with them in that tabernacle? Yes, clearly it was. Solomon eventually built a permanent house for him to dwell, a much larger edifice. Was the Shekinah there in that experience? Yes, it was. But in their rebellion, eventually Babylon came and the Shekinah glory disappears from the temple. Now, how long were they in Babylon? Does anybody know? 70 years, that's right. And after the 70 years, God calls the people to come out of Babylon and to rebuild the temple that's been destroyed. He rose up men like Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah. These all were there to encourage God was giving prophetic messages to drive the people to rebuild that temple. Now what's interesting about this time is that many of those who were called out of Babylon, guess what? They didn't want to go. They had made homes there, families there. They had gotten comfortable in Babylon, and they didn't want to go back and rebuild that temple, but there was a remnant, wasn't there? There was a faithful few, we could say, that took the task that God had put before them, and it was a tough task. Were there troubles in rebuilding that temple? Yes, you read in the books of Nehemiah and other places over and over the enemies of God trying to thwart the rebuilding of this temple. Haggai chapter 2 and verses 1 through 9 is one of the most encouraging promises you will read in this rebuilding of this structure. It says, In the seventh month, on the 21st of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel the son of Shealtel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Jehoiada, the, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Interesting question. Would the temple that they're building be anywhere close to the glory that Solomon's temple was? No, this bothered them so much, some of the older men were actually weeping over what they were seeing as this temple was being rebuilt. In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehoiada, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you. Amen. Amen. According to the word that I covenanted with you when, I came, when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Is that a wonderful promise? You better believe it. So let's review what we have so far. First of all, Israel builds a sanctuary. It's a great san sacrifice for them to do so. We saw that in the very beginning. It starts with God's presence, which is that Shekinah glory. And there's no doubt of that presence as it was manifested when the temple was dedicated. It was manifested even in the judgments of God that took part against his enemies. Number two, they depart from God's law, God Shekinah, eventually that glory departs from the temple. Number three, they end up in Babylon. Number four, they're called out of Babylon after that time that they're there, but many of the people do not leave, but yet a small remnant does and are faithful to God's command. All right, so the fifth point is that they're promised that this glory will return. Matter of fact, he says that it will be greater than the former. Greater than the former. Now what's fascinating as you look at this experience of them rebuilding the temple is that there are 500 years since the time that temple was rebuilt and the time that Jesus walked into that temple. Do you hear what I'm saying, brother and sister? 500 years there was no Shekinah in that temple. 
There was no Ark of the Covenant in that temple. You can imagine the people as they would minister, the priests as they would minister in there, having to, by faith, go through the motions of that sanctuary service, recognizing that there is no Shekinah glory in that holy place. The high priest goes in on that Day of Atonement. There is no overwhelming glory. There is nothing. And I don't know if they set a box there to take the place of the Ark of the Covenant. I'm not sure what they did to go through that service But by faith, they were going through the service and they're asking the questions, where are the miracles of the God that we read about? The God that was with our fathers, where is He? It was silent. It was as if He wasn't there at all. Great Controversy, page 24. She says, the second temple, the temple we're discussing right now, had not equaled the first in magnificence, nor was it hallowed by those visible tokens of the divine presence which pertain to the first temple. There was no manifestation of supernatural power to mark its dedication. No cloud of glory was seen to fill the newly erected sanctuary. No fire from heaven descended to consume the sacrifice upon its altar. The Shekinah no longer abode between the cherubim in the most holy place. The ark, the mercy seat, and the tables of the testimony were not to be found therein. No voice sounded from heaven to make known to the inquiring priest the will of Jehovah for centuries. The Jews had vainly endeavored to show wherein the promise of God given by Haggai had been fulfilled. Yet pride and unbelief blinded their minds to the true meaning of the prophet's words. What was that promise again? The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former. How was the glory of that latter temple greater than the former? That's right. Christ came in. And we read in great controversy, the second temple was not honored with the cloud of Jehovah's glory, but with the living presence of the one in whom dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily, who was God himself manifest in the flesh. The desire of all nations had indeed come to his temple when the man of Nazareth taught and healed in the sacred courts. In the presence of Christ and in this only did the second temple exceed the first in glory. Now let me ask you something. Whose glory was it that dwelt in the first temple? Jesus. Jesus. Now why are you telling me that the glory of the second was greater than the first when it's the same being? How many people could behold the glory of the first? The high priest. How many people could behold the glory of the second? Anybody who came into his presence. Amen? What God did here, and it's, it's uh, tucked under that first underlined sentence, it says that who was God, Jesus was God himself manifest where? In the flesh. God came, the Shekinah glory is dwelling now in the flesh, in the fallen nature that you and I have. Amazing. Remember when Moses had to veil his face? Moses was a type of who? Of Christ. As Israel's intercessor veiled his countenance because the people could not endure to look upon its glory, so Christ, the divine mediator, veiled his divinity with humanity when he came to earth. Had he come clothed with the brightness of heaven, he could not have found access to men in their sinful state. They could not have endured the glory of His presence. Therefore, He humbled Himself and was made in the likeness of sinful flesh that He might reach the fallen race and lift them up. How did that glory outshine the glory of the first temple? Because it was accessible to all. Amen? This brings us to the sixth point. The Christ manifests His glory in the temple. And this Christ is the fullness of God in the flesh. Let's, let's rebuild this uh, review. Israel builds this sanctuary in the wilderness. It's a great sacrifice. It's a willful sacrifice for them to build it, for his, for his dwelling place, for the presence of the Shekinah. There's no doubt that he dwelt there. The indwelling of that glory was manifest in many ways. Number two, They depart from God's law, they go into apostasy, and God's Shekinah eventually 
He laments over it, but eventually he pulls away from his people. Number three, because of this, eventually they end up in Babylon. Number four, they're called out of Babylon to rebuild. Most do not, but a small remnant does. That building, that rebuilding is a tough task, by the way, and needed much encouragement, which brings us to number five. They are promised through the prophet Haggai that the, the glory will return and it will be greater than the former. And number six, that glory was Christ, the fullness of God. He came in the flesh. He manifested that glory in the temple. Is everybody with me? Does all this make sense? This is a pattern, friends. I want you to look at this pattern because we're going to see it rebuilt again. Have you ever heard of global versus local application in Bible prophecy? Sometimes something is talked about locally, such as the nation of Israel. But in the New Testament, they become global. It's no longer the nation of Israel. It's no longer physical Jews. But what is it in the New Testament? Spiritual. And it's a worldwide movement. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our, our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Who is the New Testament Israel? It's the church, isn't it? Israel, the New Testament Israel, must build a sanctuary. It will be a great sacrifice to do so. It starts with God's presence and the Shekinah, and there's no doubt of His presence in the signs and the wonders. How do we know that the New Testament church is the temple of God. Ephesians 2, verses 20 through 22. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for what? Oh yeah, There's, there it is. For a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Was there a great sacrifice in building this temple? Yeah, who was the chief cornerstone? It was Christ. He was the one that gave the biggest sacrifice, wasn't he? But he said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Did those early disciples and apostles give up their lives for the building of this temple? You better believe it. It wasn't gold and silver and cloth anymore. It was their very existence that they poured into this experience. Matter of fact, Matthew 19, Peter said, We have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? Was there an indwelling at the dedication of this temple? Yeah, we find it in the early rain. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Didn't God's Shekinah glory fill that original tabernacle? Yeah, we find the same thing happening in the dedication of God's New Testament temple. Were there manifestations of God's judgment like what came upon Korah and his sympathizers? Do you remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? Does that sound like glorious judgment that's coming from God, instantaneous even? There were evidences. People were raised from the dead. People were healed on the spot. There was no doubt that the presence of God was with them. Amen? Amen? Number two, they depart from God's law. God's law departs from them as well as the Shekinah. What happened to Israel? They went into apostasy. If you follow church history, and I'm talking about the visible church, what begins to happen? Wolves come in among the flock. Apostasy begins to happen, so much so that we have the rise of the infamous papacy, a compromise of truth, the church falls into apostasy, the law is forgotten, and the visible church departs from God. There's always a faithful remnant, though, amen? amen? But the visible church departs from God. Just like Old Testament Israel, number three, they end up in where? Babylon. Now, is this physical Babylon? No, this would be spiritual Babylon. How long were they there? 1,000? 260 days, a prophecy that's so prevalent in the Bible, it's mentioned seven times. This is how long they would be in this bondage in apostasy with Babylon. Number four, are they called out of Babylon? Yeah. Are they called out to rebuild? Yes. After the 1,260 years, when you study prophecy, 1798, 
the papacy is taken out of power, the little book of Daniel is opened, and men and women began to understand the time prophecy that was coming upon them of 1844. And what was the message? Come out of her, my people. Now let me ask you a question. Did everybody come out of Babylon? Most stayed in, just like Israel of old, didn't they? Was there a faithful small remnant that came out of Babylon to rebuild the temple? Yes. You read about that early Advent movement. They came out. They answered the call. They were faithful in the promise to rebuild God's temple. Was it an easy task to rebuild that temple? Did they come up against the enemies of God, trying to discourage them? You know, it's interesting. There's a lot of debate in the evangelical world about the third temple. You ever hear this talk? Oh, there's going to be a third temple. And where are they looking? Every time you talk about the third temple, where are they looking? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. They're looking for a physical temple in physical Jerusalem. Where should they be looking? Spiritual. There is a third temple, friends. It's the church, and it's being rebuilt right now. Amen? <clears throat> so they're called out of Babylon to rebuild. Not, not everybody comes out. A small remnant comes out. Now, number five, they're promised that His glory will return. I believe that this promise in Haggai is twofold. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more it is a little while, I will what? Shake heaven and earth. Will there be a shaking? Yeah? The sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Didn't Jesus say, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do what? Also, and he even says, and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. You know, I believe in this parallel uh, time period that we're looking at between the nation of Israel and God's New Testament church, that we are in this 500-year period. Not, not literally. Please don't misunderstand me. But what was happening during this 500 years? Were there any miracles? Was there any manifestations of God's glory in that second temple? No. They were going through the motions. They were asking the question, where is God? You ever run into somebody today who says, why isn't the miracles happening today like they happened during the apostles' time? Why aren't people healed instantaneously right in front of us? Why can't we raise the dead like they did? Where is God? And many are asking the question. They're trying to fill the Shekinah glory with music and entertainment and excitement. They're trying to bring all these things into the sanctuary when we're truly missing the Shekinah, the indwelling of the fullness of God. Why did Jesus have to cleanse the temple? Maybe... We, myself included, need a cleansing. Amen? He cleansed the temple that that house would be a house of prayer. He cleansed the temple that God's presence could be there. We need to get back to the basics of Christianity, don't we? The primitive faith of those who laid the first stones in this New Testament temple, we need to get back to that experience. Remember our text this morning? Colossians 1.27. Now this morning we were talking about the mystery of the gospel. Tonight we're talking about the glory of his presence. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. And what is the glory of that mystery? Christ in you, the hope of what? The hope of glory. What was it that made the second temple more glorious than the first? We said it was the presence of Christ, didn't we? But then we backed up and said, whoa, wait a second. The presence of Christ was in the first. What was it that made the second more glorious than the first? It was the presence of Christ in fallen humanity that was accessible to how many? Everybody. What will make the second glory of this New Testament temple greater than the first? Because what once was local will soon be global. 
and God's glory, the fullness of his presence will be in every one of his believers. Amen? Amen. The character, remember, what is the glory of Christ? It's the character. 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed. I want you to hear the echo of Haggai's promise, okay? The glory will come in and be greater than the first. Beloved, now we are the children of God, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is, and everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. Does that sound like a promise, friends? Will He complete the good work that He started in you? Does He want to manifest Himself a dwelling, a permanent dwelling in each one of us? Yes. Don't lose heart, friends. Don't let go of this promise. God has promised to finish the work that He started. I believe it, don't you? Let's look at the pattern. Israel, the New Testament Israel, builds a sanctuary. It's a great sacrifice. It starts with His presence. There are miracles. All kinds of things are happening in the book of Acts. There's no doubt that His presence is there. They've had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the outpouring of that early rain. Number two, eventually, wolves come in among the flock and they start to depart from God's law. God, Shekinah, departs. The miracles stop. The healings stop. Number three, they end up in Babylon. It's a spiritual Babylon for how long? 1,000 260 years. Then they are called, number four, out of Babylon to rebuild the church. Most do not. Most are comfortable. Do you run into the comfortable who are still in Babylon? And they say, that's all right. I like where I'm at right now. I got family in that church. I grew up in that church, right? It's not about truth anymore. It's about comfort. Most did not come out of Babylon, but there was a remnant that did from that 1844 movement. And that church, that temple, has been rebuilt ever since. Number five, we are promised that this glory, His glory, will return. And I would submit to you this evening, it will be greater than the first. Number six, the Christ. The fullness of God in the flesh will manifest His glory in the temple. What am I talking about, friends? It's the latter rain. It's the latter rain. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former. I believe that God has saved the best for last, don't you? You know, when I read the book of Acts, doesn't your heart burn within you? Oh, I long to see the power of God like that was, as it's written there in the book of Acts. The miracles, the things that were happening as God was moving, and there was no doubt that the presence of God was with His people. The third temple will be filled with the glory of God. What is that third temple? It's the church. It's the New Testament church. And everyone who's a part of it will reflect the character of Christ perfectly. What will this look like? Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 14, a wonderful promise, says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Well, that reminds me of Revelation 18. After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his what? Glory. With his glory. Every believer, everyone who is a part of this New Testament church who allows Christ to finish the work will perfectly reflect his character and the entire world, we're told, will be illuminated with whose glory? His glory. Does that sound like a greater glory than the first? Is the latter <coughs> rain greater than the early rain? You better believe it. Christ Object Lessons, we looked at this this morning. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of Himself in His church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in His people, then He will come to claim them as His own. Amen. Christ wants a dwelling place in you. Amen. He wants a permanent dwelling place in me. He wants His church to be filled once again with that Shekinah glory. I'm going to look at it one more time just to solidify it in your minds. Old Testament Israel built a sanctuary. It was a great sacrifice. It started with the presence of the Shekinah. There is no doubt to the presence that God was with them. 
New Testament Israel builds a sanctuary. They as well make a great sacrifice. It started with the presence of Shekinah. Miracles, signs, and wonders went with them where they went. Number two, ancient Israel departed from God's law. Eventually, God's Shekinah departed from them. New Testament Israel, the church, departed from God's law, went into apostasy. The miracles, the signs, and the wonders ceased to be. Number three, both the Old Testament Israel and the New Testament church end up in Babylon for a certain amount of time. The Old Testament, 70 years. The New Testament in spiritual Babylon, 1,260 years. Both, number four, are called out of Babylon to rebuild God's temple. Most do not come out. A small remnant in both occasions comes out of Babylon to take upon themselves this great work. Number five, to encourage us to continue that work, the promise is given that Christ will come in to that temple. The glory of the latter will be greater than the first. And number six, the Christ, the fullness of God in the flesh, manifests his glory in the temple. Our closing text, Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may what? Dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to Him, who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever.